Um, it's also attending to the formal and aesthetic features of a book, which you will be asked to do in your critical literacy text set too. So we'll do that by turning to Where the Wild Things Are, right? the book written and illustrated by Maurice Sendick. But I do have some other books here too that I want us to look at and think through. So the whole book approach, uh, she wants us to begin, even if we don't always do it with students, to do it ourselves when we first approach a book is think about the sort of cover illustration. One thing you might want to do is, uh, you know, also at some point go through the book and see whether or not this exact same illustration appears within the book, right? Or, or if it's a variation of something that happens in the book or if this doesn't occur. And what does that tell us? But the front cover, she tells us to think about the spine, the back cover, right? Back covers are, are often blank or not. Um, hardcover books, right? Is a dust jacket doing something? Is there something interesting happening on the inside of the book once you take the dust jacket off? For example, in your copies of the crossover and booked by Alexander Kwame, uh, Alexander Kwame, when you take off the dust jacket, you'll see that it's a basketball or a soccer ball underneath. All right, so Where the Wild Things Are, Story and Pictures by Maurice Sendek. So one of the things that you'll want to do is be able to identify the medium of the book because mediums mean different art, right? Um, painting is different than drawing with painting on top. It's different than the sort of collage work, uh, mixed media painting, and so on. So paying attention to that, paying attention to the type and font. Now, so I know that this book doesn't tell us what the medium is, so we'll look in some other books where we can see where it tells us more about the medium. But you can tell us what the sort of color schemes are, right? That's all sort of pastel, muted uh, tones, mostly in earth tone colors, but a more pastel uh, coloration of it. Uh, looking closely, you can see that is sort of uh, pencil uh, work, right, because we have a lot of cross hatching, and then it's sort of painted on top uh, with watercolors. And we can tell this by looking, um, even though this particular book doesn't tell us. Um, sometimes uh, we want to see, you know, uh, any sort of Caldecott winning book, which all the books I have here will be Caldecott books, um, but they're a good place to begin sort of this sort of whole book approach to reading a picture book. Um, well, that's my little book play I put in here. These are fly leaves, right? So the sort of first pages, sometimes they're blank, sometimes they're illustrated. But what does this do, right? What, what does this do by having all of this? It immerses us immediately into the jungle. We know the book actually begins with Max in his house, but the fly leaves begin someplace else instead. They begin inside the jungle of his imagination. Where the Wild Things Are, this is a half title page. A half title page has only the title, whereas the full title page, Where the Wild Things Are, a story and pictures by Maurice Sendick. Um, and here we have, we can see our wild, uh, wild things and Max are interacting here. Okay. So what I want you to notice as I'm flipping through is less about the story and pay attention to the framing, the white space, and how it changes. Right, so we know that it begins with Max in his house. It's a story you're all familiar with. Uh, if not, reread it on your own. Uh, but it begins with him in his house, and then pay attention to how the white, white space disappears. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. It's getting a little bit bigger. Um, pay attention to the picture. Right? He has this little creature. We'll see that again. So notice that the borders, right, the white space is getting smaller. So he made mischief of one kind and another and another until his mother called him and said, wild thing. And Max said, I'll eat you up. And he was sent to bed without eating anything. Right? So it's the kid sent to his room. That very night in Max's room, a forest grew. And so one of the things that's really beautiful about Maurice Sendick's one is when he takes the everyday, the mundane, the bedpost, 
and they start to become the trees. And Max is, he doesn't care, right? He's uh, the door frame is becoming a tree instead of the ceiling. It's all a canopy of leaves. And we can even see, I guess, that, that the borders here, the tree is even extending outside, so it's no longer fully a square shape. The trees are taking over. And the forest, and it grew. And look, the trees are expanding. And we can still see the outline of his furniture in the background, but it's mostly forest. Look how little the white space is now. Compare that to here and here. And the forest grew and grew. And now it's a full page illustration. Right? The white space is gone around the picture altogether, and the picture goes all the way to the gutter of the book. Now it's in the forest. And grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around him. Look, it's the world all around him. There is no more white space. There's no more of that domesticity of the book itself. And then he gets in a boat and he sails. And look, the gutter of the page is a tree. And so it's starting to expand over here. This is one of the ways that uh, where the wild things are. Look, it keeps expanding. The sea monster's taking over as he's traveling through the weeks and the days and year uh, to the land where the wild things are. Until all of a sudden, where we've always had uh, the writing on one side, the illustration on the other, illustration across the top, and now text down at the bottom, right? He meets the wild things. And this uh, wild thing looks familiar because this was the illustration that he drew. And we'll look more closely at the wild things in a second. All right, uh, he came to a place where the wild things are. Uh, and they roared their terrible roars and they gnashed their terrible teeth. And they rolled their terrible eyes and they showed their terrible claws. But we can look closely and see that these are not really terrifying creatures at all, right? This one's wearing like a nice little Argyle sweater. They're sort of these hybrid. Their faces are so round and their eyes are round and their teeth are sharp and their claws are sharp. But they don't, um, the language of gnashing and roaring and terrible doesn't quite coincide with these pictures where they're still sort of pastel colored. And this one has like all our hair looks like mine, right? Um, and they have chicken feet and they're like little lions with goat parts and stuff. Right? They're, they're not nearly as, as scary as the language is. And also we know, of course, Max invented them. We know that because we saw them early on here. All right, so they're of his mind. Um, you'll see that the white space that's at the bottom keeps shrinking, right, as Max... Um, says be still and he takes over and he becomes uh, the leader of all the wild things right he says now let the wild rumpus begin and then we have several pages of the wild rumpus where it's a two-page illustration the moon is one of the constants uh, linking his bedroom to the land of the wild things. Although the moon waxes and wanes in size, um, it's something that's constant throughout. So we have several pages of this. But then he starts to feel lonely and it's dawn, right? Uh, connected back with uh, darkness and nighttime with sort of wildness and daylight with home. And so we'll sail, sail back home and we see the size of the pictures diminish again, right? He sails again. Now it's back to the half page where it's in the gutter and gets smaller until he's in his room. Right? And it's contained, not with the white border, but it is still contained. And his dinner was there and it was still hot. And the, the words even go onto this page where there's nothing, right? So, so it lets us know all about his sort of imagination. So that's part of the visual uh, whole book reading, a sort of quicker one, because I wanted to show a few other books. 
uh, The Journey by Aaron Becker, which is uh, another Caldecott um, Award uh, honor book, uh, very recent. It's sort of a grown-up version of Harold and the Purple Crayon. Um, so that you will look, it's a wordless book. Wordless books are fantastic. Because you give it to the reader and you ask them what is happening. Right, and so this is a whole book about her sort of boredom. Uh, you'll see the sort of uh, sepia tone, right, which is the sort of brown color that we associate with old films, uh, with a little burst of red. And red for her is always going to be the color of imagination. She's sort of bored, she has her, um, her scooter, a kite, a basketball. Nobody wants to play 